I'm going to read the scripture today. Um, the first one is Isaiah 64, 8. Yet you, Lord, are our father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are the work of your hand. And then we have John 3, 16 through 17. For God expressed his love for the world in this way. He gave his only son so that whoever believes in him will not face everlasting destruction, but would have everlasting life. Here's the point. God didn't send his son into the world to judge it. Instead, he is here to rescue a world headed toward certain destruction. And then the last um, reading is John 14, 6 through 7. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and you have seen him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Don't trip. <laughs> Let us pray. Dear gracious and almighty Lord, you are the one who came and has given us hope. You are the one who fills us with your love. And you are the one who has rescued us from certain destruction. God, you are our hope. Because of you involved in our lives, we can know life and love. So Christ, we ask, cultivate your heart within us today. Cultivate yourself within us. Grow within us, you. So that when we go out into the world, people don't just see our mess-ups, but they see your grace and forgiveness. We thank you, God. Lord, as we explore this topic today, may it be your words that are heard and not mine. May it be your way that we follow and not just our own. Amen. Well, starting last week, we've begun a new series for the summer. And the theme of this series is cultivating God's people. We're focused on God cultivating within us His heart, His passion, and His love. As I talked about last week, all year long, since the beginning, of, since January, we have focused ourselves on, on building better versions of us, clearing the way for God to come into our lives and to grow Christ's heart within us. If you kind of think about this idea of cultivating a field, for, for the last <coughs> Excuse me. For the last several months, we've been focused on getting the stumps and the, the rocks and all the big items out of the way. And we've been making sure that that ground is ready so that we can run the plow or the tiller or the cultivator through it. So that we can get it to where the ground now is ready and soft and, and fresh and able to, be, to, to have God's heart planted within us. And so, I want us to focus on this entire summer one concept. I think sometimes churches can overwhelm our congregations because we try to get too much in. Too many things. You need to focus on all these different things. Well, there's one thing I want you to focus on all summer long. Between now and August. God's cultivation of you. One thing, let God cultivate himself in you. And so what that means then is every day, every week, every whenever, you say, God, I want, you, you pray, God, cultivate your heart within me. God, cultivate your heart within me. We've cleared out all the boulders, we've cleared out the stumps, we've cleared out the big things that are going to prevent you from moving through. And now, please, plant your soul in the field of my heart. Last week we, we focused on the idea and the image of, of God cultivating his, his, himself through, through the image of a pottery, of, of, of being shaped, being his clay being shaped. And Denise, if you'd go ahead and put up that first verse, um, this here is, is kind of what I, I'd like to encourage us to be our theme for the summer, our theme verse. If there's one verse that you memorize, I don't know about you and how you go about memorizing scripture. I, I've been trying to do it since I was a kid and I don't have very much memorized. But this one is one that I, I've, I've worked on. And so Isaiah 64, 8. Yet you, Lord, are our father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are the work of your hand. I want to ask us to challenge ourselves to think about that all summer long. 
How am I allowing the Lord to shape himself in me? And one of the beautiful parts about being clay is that when we are truly being shaped by the Lord, our hearts and souls are not palpable, but malleable. malleable. Thank you. She knew the word I was thinking. That's why Linda and I are cool. <laughs> malleable. There are times when, when you know, a potter, the goal of a potter, um, when they put the clay on the potter's wheel, is to keep the clay soft until it is finished. And then when it is finished, they'll put it into the kiln and solidify it. But even at that, there are ways to soften that clay again. You ground it up and you add water to it and you can soften it all again, even after it's hardened completely. And so what God is asking us to do is to be like clay. To be like the clay that we know. Well, actually, you know what? I'm not, I don't dig in the dirt as much out here as I did when I, in, in Tulsa. And in Tulsa, there was a lot of clay underneath. Like as a kid, once you got past a certain layer of digging in the dirt, underneath it was clay. And you got a little annoyed because you couldn't dig the hole any deeper. And my mother didn't like the fact that I was covered in dirt when I came in, but whatever. That, that, that idea of clay and the digging in and being moldable. That's what Christ wants to do with us. And so this whole summer, I want us to focus on different aspects of God's heart. The kind of things that you can, um, you can go during the week and focus on that particular aspect. And maybe that's what the Lord is going to ask you to build up within you. Today, I want us to think about God cultivating his passion for Christ within us. You see, if we were going to look at God's heart and we were going to ask him to cultivate himself within us, then that means we're going to ask him to cultivate and and shape and build within us the things that he cares about, the things that are most important to him. And for him, for God, the number one focus is loving us through His Son, Jesus Christ. You see, from the very, very beginning, from when we were created, and when you hear this story, we, we, we maybe can recall through all sorts of different ways the story of, of Adam and Eve. And there they are, God's creation. God, God created Adam out of the dirt, out of the clay. At least that's how the story goes. And He molds him, and He shapes him, and then He breathes his life into him. And then he makes Eve and does the same. But what happens as these two creatures, these beautiful creatures that are being shaped after God's own heart, the one thing that he puts into them that makes us, the one thing that makes us God's, in, in God's image is our freedom to choose to follow him or not. You see, God is his own independent being. And therefore, since he's his own independent being, he can choose whatever he wants. Well, he didn't want to make us into robots. He wanted to make us into people who had the choice to follow. And so into these soft, palatable, malleable, not palatable, we don't eat people here. (laughs) Malleable people. He placed his image, his freedom, his free will to choose. And unfortunately, we chose to reject him sometimes. To walk away. You see, here Adam and Eve had this beautiful love, Christ-like relationship, this intense compassion for one another and for God. And then there was a moment in which they said, you know what, I'm going to choose to not follow you. Somebody came up to him and said, oh, you can be like God. You don't need to have him in your life. And they listened. And they chose to reject. How many times have we done that? Have we said, God, you're first, and then you're like, oh, wait, no, this is more important. And we keep trying to put God up here, and he says, look, you've chosen the other way. i I got to let you be because I love you that much. And so in that moment when God said, I love you so much that I'm going to let you choose the opposite, but I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to still pursue you. I'm going to still chase after you. I'm going to still show you how much I love you. And that's where God developed this focus on Christ. 
Because you see, even in that moment, way back in the garden, way back in that garden when, when God was looking at Adam and Eve and wondering, are you, and wanting them to come back and wondering if they were really going to choose him again. And when they chose and they decided to walk away from God, he said, I'm, I'm going to let you walk away, but I'm not going to leave you alone. And they came back and they said, God, we need you, we need you. And he says, okay. And way back then, he began to create this plan of sending Christ to show us the way. Way back then, he began to direct the way to God, the way back home by saying, I'm going to bring my son, I myself. God himself was going to incarnate himself. That word incarnate is, is a hard word sometimes to take on because carnage also comes from that word. And carne is the word for flesh in Greek and in Spanish and in Latin. Carne meaning flesh. God became flesh. Not just some idea out there, but an actual physical being. He says, I'm going to show you the way. I'm going to love you. I'm going to wash away your sins. I'm going to give you hope. I'm going to give you life. I'm going to give you freedom. I'm going to give you everything you need so that you can know you follow me and you won't experience the destruction of the world. And so as we ask, as we ask God to cultivate himself within us, we ask him to cultivate Christ within us. We ask him to cultivate within us a centeredness on God. Denise, go ahead to John 3, 16 and 17. I, I, I think a, a lot of us, probably the most familiar verse out in scripture is John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his own, one and only son, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life, shall not perish but have eternal life. Well, I like this version of it. This is from the voice because I love the way it talks at the end. For God expressed his love to the world in this way. He gave his only son so that whoever believes in him will not face everlasting destruction, but will have everlasting life. Here's the point. God did not send his son into the world to judge it. Instead, and here's the part I love, the way it reads. Instead, he is here to rescue a world headed towards certain destruction. You see, God is so focused on loving us that he is focused on Christ as our rescue, as our direction, as our center, as the thing that everything about us should come out of. And so he sends Christ to rescue us from certain destruction, to keep us from hurting ourselves, to keep us from harming ourselves, to keep us, to give us the way to keep us from, from causing problems in the world. And the more that we follow him, the more that we embrace him, the more that we let his heart be cultivated within us, the more we can find peace in this world. The other verse from John, go ahead to the next one. It says that Jesus made it very clear, look, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You follow me. You go my direction. You let God cultivate my heart within you and you will not only know God, but you will also know the way home. You will know his peace in your life. You will know hope. You will let God shape you into something that will know God and other people will know Him through you. Go ahead to the next slide. You see, when we allow God to cultivate Christ within us, we become more and more like Him every day. You see, Christ is the hope for the world. The way of Christ brings about love, peace, grace, hope. In Matthew chapter 5 through 7, which we're going to spend time in the fall going through the Sermon on the Mount. That's where it's found. It's Matthew 5, uh, chapter 5 through chapter 7. It, he begins by telling people saying, look, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those whose spirit is completely broken and you feel like nothing else in this world matters. Blessed are you because I love you and I will give you hope again. I will restore you. As you follow me, you can find wholeness. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For those who want good in this world. Who fight for right. Who seek to do good things. Who say, I will never let you go. Blessed are those who follow Christ. And then he continues on by saying, 
when we are following in the way of Christ, we choose to love our enemies. Because it's easy to love the people you like, but it's not that easy to love the people who hurt you. It says, blessed are those who learn to love and forgive. You see, Christ is the hope of the world. He is the hope when we embrace Him, when we let Him be our complete center, the thing that has been cultivated deep in our souls. His way, His mindset, His everything. When we dig into Scripture and understand Him more, then we can begin to bring about hope and peace and joy in this world. I think sometimes, wouldn't it be glorious if we had a world that had no more wars, no more conflict, no more hatred because somebody doesn't believe like we believe, no more fighting, no more anger, no more hurting of one another. And then I realized that the way we can do that is going to take a lot of time and a lot of work. But if we follow in the way of Christ and we live out the Sermon on the Mount, we will be able to build a world like that. So there's two things that I, th- or actually three. I should look at my notes since I put them down. There are two things that when we let Christ's heart be cultivated within us, that we begin to do. The first is that we become aware of ourselves. We become, as we allow God to shape us, we become the work of His hands. We then begin to see the parts of us where we are broken still. Where we're maybe not a smooth piece of clay and we need Him to work on that. And we become aware of our own sinfulness, our own brokenness, our own unhealth. And so when we ask God, please cultivate Christ's heart within us, we begin to become aware of saying the things that are not like Christ. We begin... To ask for the Holy Spirit to let go of those things. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 7, 7 through 16, but I'm not going to read them all. Paul is talking about how he knows very clearly that he is not perfect. But because he follows in the way of Christ, he at least clings to the anointed one. And he knows very clearly that he is aware of himself now because of the way of, because of how Christ is moving in him but he's going to strive for God and these are these are this is Philippians 3 7 through 11 out of the voice but whatever i used to count as my greatest accomplishments i've written them off as a loss because of the anointed one and more so i now realize that all i gained and thought was important was nothing but yesterday's garbage Compared to knowing the anointed Jesus, my Lord. For him, I have thrown everything else aside. It's nothing but a pile of waste. And so, so that I may gain him. When it counts, I want to be found belonging to him. Not clinging to my own righteousness based on law, but actively relying on the faithfulness of the anointed one. This is true righteousness. Supplied by God, acquired by faith. I want to know him inside and out. I want to experience the power of his resurrection and join in his suffering shaped by his death so that I may arrive safely at the resurrection from the dead. Christ, Paul makes it very clear that because of Christ he has found the goodness in the world. Because of Christ the things that he used to focus on don't matter, only the way of Christ. The second thing that happens when we let the, the, the way of Christ become cultivated within us, when we let Christ's heart, is that we become aware of the world around us. This week, uh, well, this semester, a lot of my reading for for class has been about understanding how other cultures experience Christ. And it's been challenging at times because some of it is very hard to read because I read about how people have skewed the view of Christ. 
as, as we've talked regularly about, but one example locally for us is that this particular tribe that we are working with, the Cheyenne Arapaho, at one point there was a United Methodist pastor that was involved in the persecution of this nation, of these people, harming them, encouraging the U.S. government to, to massacre. And so what's happened then is that tribe's view of Christ is skewed because the one who was of Christ showed them death and destruction and not God. And so when we follow the way of Christ, we begin to see that it is not right to do those things. That it is not right to, to go in the name of God down another path that is not of God. We become aware of the world around us. We see the hurt. We see the brokenness. We see those in our own community that need us to take on the heart of Christ. And not let them go. When we let the way of Christ cultivate himself within us. We see the world around us in a new light. The third thing that happens when we let the way of Christ cultivate himself within us. We act. Because we can no longer allow the people we see around us be broken, who are broken, we can no longer let them stay that way. We have to do something. That's one of the things I love about this church, is that we can't avoid doing. When we see somebody hurting, we immediately pull out our pocketbooks, pull out our whatever is needed, and say, how can I help? We show up at people's houses. We go and we call on our friends and say, hey, can I take care of you? What do you need? That is critical to allowing the heart of Christ to be cultivated within us. This summer, let us focus on being God's clay. Let us focus on God cultivating Himself within us, becoming aware of ourselves, aware of the world around us, and acting. Acting on what Christ sees. So let Christ's heart be cultivated in you. Amen. We'd like to spend some time blessing these benches before we send them because um, prayer is powerful. Um, if you have taken the time to write a, a, a card, um, I'd like to encourage you to either come up and place it on the bench or give it to somebody to walk it up with you. If you'd like to come forward and lay your hands on the bench or sit on the bench, um, and together we will pray and send these on to, um, to Clinton. So I'd like to invite those of you who would, would like to come up and, and lay your hands on the bench to please do. And then um, for those of the rest of us, just stay seated and we'll continue on there. So if you'd like to come up or place your card on the bench, We'll go from there. <laughs> Dustin comes up and forgets the card. That's your husband. <laughs> you guys can come on up around. Feel free to, to reach up, pray, whatever. <laughs> Y'all are cracking me up. <laughs> um, there you go. Let us pray. Father God, there are children in this community, in this state, who need to know your love. And Father, as we prepare these benches, Lord God, may they know they are loved. May they not only feel the comfort of an unsplinter-filled place to sit, but Lord, may this also remind them that they can sit on your lap 
and they can feel your arms around them and they can know your love. And they can know that there are people in this world who who can hurt them, but there are people in this world who can heal them and hold them close. And God, God, we pray for every one of these kids. May they know they are loved by you. May they know Christ's love in their lives. May they know the wholeness that you bring. God, we pray for Donna, the pastor at that church. We pray that she can continue to minister and reach out and embrace and care for these kids. That they can know God loves them. That they can find your restoration. And that relationship can be restored. We thank you, Christ, for the chance to serve them. The Holy Spirit, heal their hearts and show us the way to love them more. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Look at the knees. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Beautiful. Come on up, Betty. Bring it up here. Good stuff, brother. Oh, I love it. Thanks, Eddie. Give me five. Good job, man. Do you want to pray over it? Do you want to kneel down and pray? Do you want to help me pray? Excuse us a second. Eddie didn't get to. We're going to pray. You're a good kid. Let us stand and hear this benediction. For I forget youth group tonight, 4.30, Crystal Beach, putt-putt. And then right after service, join us for chicken and potato salad and good stuff and the mission dinner and just awesomeness and chicken. We're very excited about chicken up here in the front. Hear this benediction. May the Holy Spirit cultivate God's heart within you. You are His clay. Amen.